everybody. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, about a year and a half later, it had sort of blown up into this full-fledged Rails app that was nearly 7,000 7, lines of code. And I just point out that a third of the, those, uh, those lines of code were test code to sort of emphasize that uh, all the problems that we ran into, you know, they weren't just from like horrible engineering practices, although that probably has something to do with it. Um, okay, so another particular feature about our app is that it's something that we change very, very, very infrequently. Uh, right? It was this thing that was running some, some provisioning code for us, and we only ever touched it when we needed to add a feature, and, and that was uh, you know, maybe every couple months. Um, but every couple months, we would come back, add a feature, uh, and everything would break. And this would happen every time, and we would have to like, le relearn the entire app, sometimes relearn all of Rails. And we would break it, and we would only discover that it would break in production, which totally sucks. So. Uh, just to give you a sense of, uh, of the pain that we went through, um, this is a screenshot from our commit log uh, from uh, the, the last month that the app was still in production. Uh, and uh, just, uh, <laughs> just to be like, totally clear, the, this is all the commits right after a commit that David made, not me. <laughs> OK, so obviously, we couldn't keep going like this. Uh, there was this feature that we were blocked on for like two months, and every time we tried to implement it, we would just like bang our head against the wall and just leave it. Um, so we decided to port the application to Haskell, um, partially for obvious reasons, uh, because it's more fun, um, but also because the errors that we were getting were, you know, the kinds of errors that you would expect to get in a language that doesn't have sort of the kinds of strong types, uh, type system that Haskell does. We would add uh, you know, an argument to a function and then forget some obscure place in the code that called that function and didn't have the argument or something like that. Um, right, so we wanted Haskell so that we could catch these kinds of bugs at compile time. Um, and uh, we also wanted something that would be easy for, easier for us to sort of relearn every time we came back to the code. Remember I mentioned that we, we really only uh, touched this code base you know, once every couple months. And so we were sort of novices to the code base every time we touched it. Um, okay, so there's like a you know like I said at the beginning of the talk, a ton of Haskell web frameworks out there, and because of sort of the particular circumstances of our experience, the frameworks that we that that were sort of out there at the time at least um, weren't exciting enough for us to use for that particular application. Um, so one of the reasons that we really didn't want to trade. Uh, sort of uh, the ability to fully understand the framework and put it in our heads in a very short amount of time when we came back to the code uh, for the flexibility of, uh, of being able to sort of organize our application in larger and changing ways over the course of its lifetime. And then finally, we really wanted to leverage the safe Haskell feature in, in uh, GHC 7.4, I think it was introduced. Um, again, because you know we were changing Haskell from being burned by uh, by these type errors, we really wanted to make sure that this code that we were introducing uh, in our application every now and again wasn't going to come and bite us when we ran in production. Um, and uh, so for those of you who don't know uh, what safe Haskell is, it's a subset of the Haskell language that doesn't allow any, uh, any unsafe extensions that would subvert the type system or the module, the, the, the module abstraction, or boundary abstraction, sorry. OK, so uh, I'll give a brief sort of demo looking at a particular app uh, in this framework called Simple. Um, and, uh, and I have sort of two goals that I would like to, uh, to get across in the demo. The first is obviously just, to, obviously just to give you an overview and hopefully encourage you to try it out next time you're uh, building a web app. Um, but the second one is uh, that I think it's a good example of uh, an end-to-end -end application that actually leverages safe Haskell. So we really use safe Haskell in this case to sort of get better guarantees out of the language. Um, and so I, you know, I sort of hope to encourage, to encourage you to try and do the same thing. But also for those of you that uh, maintain libraries, I would plead you to please, please, please uh, try and mark your package it to your, sorry, your modules safe or trustworthy so that we can actually use the libraries uh, in our applications. Okay, so this is simple. 
Uh, in the previous slide, I said it's under a thousand lines of code, but really you can understand the framework in these like five lines. And if you're familiar with WAI, this is basically uh, sort of a little monad wrapper around uh, the application type in WAI. It's just a monad that's going to encapsulate some application state, that's S. Um, it uh, has a request, and in the end, it's either going to produce some sort of monadic result, A, uh, or a response. Um, okay, so with that in mind, uh, let's look at some code. So, uh, let me... Do I have like three minutes? Okay. Uh, let me uh, not show you the actual web, web application and just get to the meat. So uh, this is our main file. Um, and so these three imports here uh, that you'll notice are not marked safe. Those are you know, things like importing the, uh, the, the warp server, which will not be in, could not be imported safe. But it actually doesn't matter because we sort of trust that that's going to do the right thing. And in fact, we're only using it in this very limited way. We can reason about, uh, you know, how it might uh, break the application, and this isn't going to uh, change very much. On the other hand, we're oh, shoot. Uh, we're using the safe keyword in front of the import for application, and that's important because the application is going to change a lot. It's going to change a lot at like two in the morning when David's a little bit tipsy, and uh, it might introduce bugs. And we would like to sort of scope how badly those bugs can ruin the application. So. Uh, what I have time for. Um, so uh, let's take a look at how this actually works. So this is sort of a subpart of the application that, uh, sorry, I should introduce, this is basically just like a simple newsfeed style application. It's called blog because the canonical thing is a blog application, but a newsfeed is a little bit more exciting. Um, so I was hoping to maybe get through implementing a couple of these controllers, but I think we'll only be able to get to sort of uh, one really problematic thing that might arise if, you, if you're not using uh, something like, say, say Pascal. So this, uh, this um, feed part of the controller is supposed to return the set of posts that the website should display. Um, so let's see what happens if we're trying. Let's see what, what what happens if we're trying if we try to in haste sort of implement this uh, just quick and dirty with, in fact, uh, some unsafe features. So um, the, uh, this, uh, this URL is going to take a, a query parameter called last post that will be you know, the last ID that the website already has so that it can display new ones. Uh, and then we, we're going to want to query, query the, the database and get the rest of the posts. Um, so this line just allows us to grab the query parameter as, uh, as a string or a byte string. Um, okay, so let's get something from the database. So with connection is going to grab a connection from the from a database connection pool, and uh, what we'll try and do is use PostgreSQL Simple, uh, which is a great library for Postgres, to um, uh, to grab uh, the results from the database. So let me just put in some boilerplate here. Um, okay, so uh, I don't really remember how to use PostgreSQL uh, simple. Uh, I remember that there's this query underscore function that lets me, you know, put in a SQL query, and I know how to write SQL queries, so let me just do that. Um, okay, so I want to uh, select the ID, author, and uh, body from the post table, um, where the ID is uh, is greater than the last poster. Oh, but how do I put the last poster back into the um, into the query? Uh, okay, I know. I can just. Use a question mark. No, I actually do know how to do it. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let me just Emma Pen. Let me just append last poster. Oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> uh, ID. Michael, if only you were coding with us, we wouldn't have all these problems. Um, okay, so I can tell you before I try to compile this that this isn't going to work because the types aren't going to work out. Uh, right? Last poster is a byte string, and 
Uh, and so it's going to treat the string as a byte string, and query expects uh, a, a something of type query. Um, OK, so let's just construct a query from this thing. Um, so I'm going to need some extra imports here. Uh, and uh, what else? Data.monoid. Um, and I think, most importantly, uh, so it turns out that PostgreSQL simple annoyingly like doesn't export the query constructor from the top level uh, from the top level module. So I have to you know import this annoying database dot PostgreSQL dot simple dot types. That will give me the type and the um, uh, the, ty the the type and the constructor. And oh, just to make the type works out, the types work out here. Let me grab the posts from the connection and I'll encode them as uh, JSON. And let's just give it something, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I think it needs to be an integer, a string, and a string, let's say. Okay, uh, let's try compiling this and see what happens. I would out something. Uh, oh, what did I do? This is not the error I wanted to get. <laughs> uh, to, oh, right, I need the actual connection. Uh, and this needs to be a list. I'm, I'm almost at the error that we want, sorry. <laughs> So if I wasn't using safe Haskell, uh, which I marked up here for uh, uh, to make the error message clear, then this would compile just fine. And in fact, I think it would probably work, except I would be able to write this sort of nice uh, query. Let's, uh, I'm not going to actually test it, but uh, slash API slash feed um, last what do they call it? Last post, whatever. Uh, equals, you know, semicolon, drop, post, or something like that. You all guess that. Um, and the problem here is that I'm really breaking this boundary abstraction. I, I shouldn't be, I mean, there's a good reason that PostgreSQL simple doesn't expose the constructor. Um, and the point is that the fact that we're using safe Haskell here has caught this error for us, even though this would have compiled fine otherwise. Uh, how much time do I have? A couple minutes. A couple minutes. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so this is turned back on. Clearly, this is the wrong way to do this. Um, and uh, yeah, instead, I'm going to use this handy dandy function that actually it turns out that we already implemented um, called find recent posts. And so find recent post is going to use this Postgres library that we built on top of PostgreSQL simple, but it doesn't do anything fancy. It's just going to, uh, uh, you know, basically select the, the post that we want. Um, so let's hopefully try and get it to a point where I can actually run this. Okay. Um, find recent posts. Uh, so find recent post takes a connection, and it takes uh, last post stir. Uh, I think it needs, uh, it takes a maybe integer, so fmap read. And we don't need this square anymore, and we don't need this. Sorry? Oh, right, thank you. And then finally, We'll actually run this. We don't need to type PS because find recent posts already types it. Okay, so hopefully this should compile and we should be able to actually run the application. Nope. Oh. Import uh, blog.models. This tick unsafely removes the maybe. <laughs> but it'll be a localized error. OK, great. Hey, uh, check, ship it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? 
and this is really Joe's story. Okay. Oh, great. So uh, we should be able to run this and grab the posts. We can see that it actually called api.feed and all that. Okay. Uh, right, so coming back to the present, just to sort of sum up. Uh, <coughs> so we've been running the same application, but built on top of Simple and Haskell, instead of our Rails app for over a year now. And in a year, we've had one uh, sort of non-isolated bug. And what I mean on non-isolated, it wasn't like a, you know, an actual bug in the implementation of the feature, but something that like broke the app in some horrible way. And in fact, the one bug that we had was uh, we just didn't handle the case where the database connection just dropped because we were lazy. Um, so that's been one year, and it's one year despite the fact that the code has doubled in size. So we've had a very similar trajectory to what we had in the Rails app, but instead of ending up in this horrible situation where we couldn't continue building on top of it, uh, we uh, were in a much better place. And we've also you know, used the framework to build three more similar applications in all sorts of uh, flavors. So one of them is just an API server, one of them is browser-based, and one of them is sort of both. Okay, uh, that's it. You can grab Symbol from Cabal, uh, and then it's also available on GitHub, and there's a tutorial on the website. Thanks. We have time for a couple questions. Questions? No? So what was the, the largest application that you have built so far? With this um, so, uh, so the application that replaced the Rails app is a, it's a, uh, it's a resource provisioner plus uh, a website for user signups, and it's about 10,000 lines of code. And how many Ruby lines do you think that would be if you had to guess? Uh, well, it, it was 7,000 lines, 7, lines of code. Okay. Probably, I mean, but it's doubled. But you've added functionality. Yeah, it's, it's, it's about doubled since, so you can figure about twice as much. Okay. Uh, but a lot of, in both cases, a lot of that is tests. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. So it, it seems that the. If I read that correctly, if I watched you correctly, the thing that saved you was a structured query function. Uh, right. Yes. Right. Well, um, no, we could have we could have just as well used uh, what Michael suggested, the actual interface that PostgreSQL Simple provides, <laughs> with the exception that, like many other libraries, unfortunately, PostgreSQL Simple does not mark itself trustworthy, and so we just can't import it. Okay. So, so I. Right in understanding that the advantage of the safe and the safe is that it kept you from using an interface that was poorly designed. Uh, uh, I don't know if I I don't know if I would say that the PostgreSQL simple interface is poorly designed, but yeah, it kept or, us from uh, using unsafe. an unsafe interface. Yeah, it kept right. us from had they marked that as safe, had they considered that safe, you would have been you would have fallen into the snare. <laughs> uh, that's true. That's okay. true. Yeah. Okay. I guess the, the question that I was really getting at is, uh -huh. you're using a question mark on, an, I, I'm assuming the ID is, is integral, right? It, yeah. So there, was really, there isn't really any kind of checking that's going to prevent it from creating a query that can't be run by Postgres. Uh, that's correct. So, so the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So it's a, so it's a security prevention, that's, but it's not really a prevention beyond security. So uh, that's right. So, uh, you know, Safe Haskell <laughs> certainly is not going to fix all bugs. Right. Um, but the goal is to try and sort of, uh, at least, you know, in our mind for the web, for the for these kinds of applications, is to leverage Safe Haskell to try and prevent the kinds of bugs that you would normally prevent with conventions. Okay, so security, not necessarily a type safety prevention. Uh, that's right. I mean, I, I didn't show type safety preventions, although they're, they're those. Maybe afterwards, I'd like to. I would be. I would love to. Yeah. Let's thank the speaker so, again. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Right? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.